Hey guys, welcome back to my watercolor crash course. We are now on our third video session, whatever you want to call it. I'm really happy to see you guys again. So last time I did a painting demo for you guys. It wasn't really a tutorial, but you were definitely welcome to paint along, but it was a good opportunity to introduce you guys in a very meaningful to at least me way, hopefully it was meaningful to you guys, in a very meaningful way to some of the common watercolor techniques and some of the common watercolor materials that watercolor artists use when they're painting. Today, I thought I would take the materials part a step further and introduce you guys to not only some of the art supplies I recommend that you guys try out if you're just getting started out and you want to get the most bang for your buck. For those of you who know you're going to like watercolor, it's just a matter of time. I get you on the same way, or I was the same way when I first started out. And I wish somebody had given me this recommendation list so I wouldn't have spent so much money on art supplies that I didn't like at all. I'm also gonna go over some of the more common art supplies and types of watercolor supplies so that you know you guys have a better understanding of the materials that artists frequently use for watercolor and hopefully can go shopping with confidence. I do a lot of art supply reviews here on the channel so if you ever have any questions if you ever want to know more about something make sure you check out the search bar see if I've talked about it and if I haven't feel free to reach out to me and ask about it you can do it in the comments section or if you really want to make sure I see it you can come hang out with me on my discord server the paint box and ask me there so I've got some of those common art supplies with me right now. I can't wait to tell you more about them today and demonstrate how they're used. So let's get started. These are the absolute basic supplies that I recommend. This is kind of a generic recommendation. It's not what I started with. It's not what I use to paint watercolor comics, but it's kind of a good all-rounder selection. And it's a fine selection if you are kind of just looking for like your minimal buy-in. Now, there are a couple of swappables, but this is also geared towards people who figure they're going to like watercolor. So maybe you're a digital artist and you already work with a lot of transparencies and you want to try watercolor or you're a marker artist and you're very familiar with transparency and with physical media and you want to try watercolor. If you're looking for cheaper buy-ins, there are cheaper buy-ins, but you're going to have a lot of frustration learning how to use the materials. So one of the reasons I'm recommending the materials that I'm recommending is because it, they're good materials. They're going to perform consistently. I can tell you how they're going to perform because I use them myself. I've talked about them a lot on the channel. I can basically vouch for them. So it's one of those things where if you don't enjoy watercolor, it might just not be the medium for you rather than it's the art supplies fighting you. I'm also going to go into different types of materials and different formats you might see those materials in a little bit later on, but I wanted to kind of start you guys off strong with just some good recommendations. So just keep in mind there are going to be chapters in this so you can kind of skip around as you need them. So to start with, we're going to start with our paper because a good watercolor paper is the foundation for a good watercolor illustration. It makes it a lot easier. And while cotton rag paper is more expensive than cellulose paper, I think it's going to be able to perform better. I use both types of paper. I'm familiar with both types of paper. And I'll talk about the differences a little bit later on. But generally, all the watercolor techniques that you see people doing, cotton rag should be able to handle that. So I would recommend the Blick Studio Block. And it being block bound means it is bound on at least two sides. This is bound on four sides. And the plus side to this is it's already stretched. You don't have to stretch it. Now, if you don't want to paint it on the block, you can just remove it from the block and paint it however you want. So it kind of adds some flexibility. Blocks are going to be more expensive than pads, but this saves you from having to stretch. And while stretching isn't the worst thing, this means you can get painting as soon as possible. So if you are just getting out, just getting started out, I would recommend the Blick Cold Press 100% Cotton Watercolor Block. This is only sold through Dick Blick, so it is harder to find, but I think it's at a fairer price point, and I think it performs really well for that price point. So definitely recommend. So for your paints, if you're just getting started out, Sometimes a pre-assembled mini palette 
can be a lot easier than buying tubes and filling half pants and doing all that. But we'll talk about that a little bit later on. This is the Core Mini Palette. It is a 12 color palette. I think the color selection is really good. I'm able to paint people with it. I'm able to paint flowers with it. I'm able to paint landscapes with it. So I think it's a fairly flexible palette. I have refilled it already from the tubes, but it comes with 12 little half pans. You can refill it as you go. They don't sell the half pans, but refilling it from the tubes works the same way, and that's a really common practice. While it does come with these mixing surfaces, I don't use them that often, and this one is filthy because I use it all the time. I really like this little palette. It's a compact palette, a good size pocket palette, and it performs quite well. And it's around $60 at time of recording. I'm gonna have all the, or I'm gonna have a dock where I have everything listed out for you guys, but I'll have certain select points listed in the description below, including prices if you're, you know, trying to shop competitively. But $60 for a watercolor palette isn't a bad deal. Now, if you don't wanna get started with professional grade, for whatever reason, maybe you're not sure if you're gonna be into watercolor at all, I would recommend the Pretty Excellent Watercolors. Now, these are a student grade, and those names are a little bit misleading just because I find that not all student grades allow you to practice the techniques that you might want to practice. They don't all perform like they should, but typically student grade paints are made a little bit cheaply or a little bit more cheaply compared to their professional grade counterparts. This is the student grade of Paul Rubens, a pretty decent watercolor brand. The only reason I'm not recommending the Paul Rubens is because I really love and really believe in the Core Mini Palette and I've used the Core Mini Palette a lot, including a lot on this channel. So that's the only reason. So this palette varies in price. This 36 half pan palette typically goes for around-ish 20 to $25 on Amazon. If you keep your eye out for a sale, you might be able to find one. So this is, like extruded chiclets of paint in a fairly thin flimsy plastic liner. The paints themselves though are really pretty good. So some might even argue they're pretty excellent. So this is basically the same palette as this. This is the Aowin watercolor palette. I think this is an earlier version of this. So if you are looking for individual half pans, go with the Aowin palette if you can find it. But otherwise, the Meiliang Pigments palette is really pretty excellent. I think you'll be pretty happy with it. So basically, if you want to get into watercolor and you immediately want a bunch of colors, you don't want to have to mix, this is a pretty good palette to get started with. But if you are looking for more professional techniques, including lifting and granulation, this is the palette to go with. So we've got paper, we've got paints. Let's talk about brushes. You don't actually need a million brushes to get started with watercolor. I would recommend you start with a mop. This is a Cotman synthetic mop. You don't need an expensive mop for this. I have had this for 10 years. The only problem is it's getting a little wobbly in the ferrule. This is one of the old wooden handled versions. So these last forever. I use this thing all the time. And mops are great for applying a lot of water or for stretching your watercolor paper. So this is definitely very, very helpful. Then I would recommend, so I am kind of, a, even though I review art supplies, when I recommend art supplies, I'm a one and done kind of person. I would prefer to spend a little bit more money and get something I'm really happy with. So that extends to other aspects of my life, like my pets. I do a lot of research before I buy anything because I wanna make sure I'm getting something that's gonna last. So these are silver black velvet watercolor brushes. They're a little bit pricier. If you're not used to watercolor, there's gonna be sticker shock. These are great. So the thing about watercolor is not always, but often the more money you spend, the happier you're gonna be over a longer period of time. That obviously tops out. You're not always gonna see a return on investment, but if you cheap out, you are typically going to be disappointed or your art supplies are gonna get used up or fall apart faster than if you invested a little bit more money. You don't need all four of these brushes just starting out, but I would recommend a size 10, a size eight, a size 
six and a size four. And what you paint is going to kind of determine what kind of brushes you would find the most useful. I paint comics, I paint people, I paint flowers, I paint foods, I paint kind of fun watercolor wibbly wobbly things like my stash buster tutorials. So I paint a pretty wide variety of things and I find that these cover the gamut for me pretty well. I do have other watercolor brushes, I do often use other watercolor brushes, but in almost all of my recent videos, and by that I mean past three years, you guys will see these brushes at some point in the process. So I have, I keep buying new silver black brushes, black velvet brushes, not because they fall apart, but because I really love them. <laughs> and uh, I will often dual wield and work with two colors on two separate brushes at the same time. So I might need like three size eights, but I've had many of these brushes for the duration of three years and they really hold up. I do need to clean this one. These are a combination of natural fibers and synthetic, which makes them a little bit tougher. But if you have ethical concerns about using natural hair brushes, which I understand, I get you. My, my concern is synthetics typically just do not perform nearly as well as a good squirrel or even a good synthetic mix. However, the Zen brushes by Royal Lanical are not bad. I haven't had a chance to play with them all that much yet, but they're pretty affordable and they're not bad. So that might be a direction to look in. And there are a lot of watercolor artists who do like synthetic brushes for their own reasons. I just find water control, i.e. when I dip them in water, they tend to drip drop a lot. So I don't like them as much as I like, you know, mixes or I like full natural hair brushes. So we have our paper, our paint, and our brushes. Now for our accoutrements, and obviously this is not the end all be all. There are so many watercolor supplies, but I wanted to keep it kind of simple and kind of easy. I would say some low tack masking tape or washi tape to stretch or to secure your watercolor illustrations to some sort of support. So this is 3M Blue Painters Tape. This is what I use when I'm painting seven inch Kara. You can find it pretty much everywhere, including Walmart. You want the original. You want it to have this crepe finish. You don't want the delicate surfaces stuff because that'll tear up your paper. You want it to actually be slightly absorbent to water so that you can actually get it to adhere to the watercolor paper you're stretching. And then I have some MT washi tape. This is some of the best washi tape I have ever used in terms of watercolor. It masks really well. It doesn't tear up the paper. It adheres things to whatever support I'm using quite well. I'm even tempted to start using this for watercolor pages, but I think that would get really expensive really fast. So this stuff is great and it comes in a variety of sizes. I mainly buy the white and the black. This is Japanese watercolor or artist tape Nichiban. I got it on St. Louis Art Supply. It's also really, really good. A little bit thinner than our MT, but here in the US, it's imported, so it's gonna be more expensive. That's the only reason I can't really recommend it, it's just, it's a little bit price prohibitive. But if you see it and you wanna give it a try, I've had good, good record with it. So next we're going to need some sort of palette. You can use a variety of things. I have found that cheap ceramic plates or glass plates, ideally, to me, the white ones from Dollar Tree work really well for this purpose. And it used to be just a dollar, but now it's a dollar 25. So cheap. If you look up ceramic palettes on Amazon, you'll find all kinds of different palettes, but those are typically in the $13 range. A dollar. You could even go to like Goodwill or Social Concerns or, you know, one of those kind of places and pick up just a couple, if they have any in their homeware section, just a couple of plates would work really well. So then we're going to need something for our water. So though you guys don't see me do this in my tutorials, that's more of a space concern. I am going to be doing this when I'm working on Kara pages again. I recommend you have two water cups. A This one says clean. This one says dirty somewhere on it. I need to clean both of them out. So the clean, you are only ever dipping a clean brush in this for a clean wash of water. The dirty is where you actually rinse your brush out. And that's gonna help prevent muddiness when it comes to your watercolor paintings. 
I also use filtered water because I live in an area that has a lot of minerals and sediments in the water just naturally. So if you live in an area that has hard water, you might want to consider distilled or filtered water. It's not a necessity, but I've actually found it really helps my watercolor and my watercolors perform more like they're supposed to. Not necessity, but nice to have. And then we need some paper towels. I like to use Viva paper towels. They are really sturdy. They, you can reuse them to an extent. They don't just fall apart when you add water to them. You can actually let them dry out and keep using them if you want to. And they don't have a particular texture. You can buy the textured ones. And sometimes you do want paper towels to add a fun texture to your work. But I love to use these for stretching watercolor paper or for lifting out. These are just such a good all rounder. So for me, it's Viva paper towels. Now, some artists will use a rag, like a terry cloth rag or a scrap of absorbent fabric. You can definitely do that. I do not have the best, uh, I don't have the best results with that. So I stick to paper towels. So one more time for those in the back, we're gonna go through all of my basic recommendations before we dive into our materials in a bit more depth. If you're just starting out, I recommend you start out with something that's gonna give you a track record for success. So I recommend you start with cotton rag watercolor paper. My recommendation would be the Blick Studio Block. Now, if you are painting, you're gonna need some paints, right? So I have two tiers of recommendations. We have the Core Mini Palette, which would be professional grade. It has 12 colors inside, and I find it quite easy to mix pretty much everything I need. And we have the Mei Liang Pigments Palette, which is 36 colors. It is th student grade, and it does have some painting and layering limitations, although not as many as many of the other student grade watercolors I've reviewed in the past have had. You're gonna need some brushes. I recommend a mop. And since I paint comics and portraits and flowers, I use use a lot of rounds. My preference is the silver black velvet watercolor brushes. You're going to need something to mix your paints on. I would recommend just a plain ceramic plate from Dollar Tree if you're just getting started out. You're going to need something to stretch your watercolors with. I recommend low tack tapes. This is 3M blue painters tape. This is empty washi tape and this is a fancy Japanese painting tape but you don't have to go fancy. Now for our accessories. I recommend two cups for your water. These are Faber Castell click and go cups with a paint puck that's a little scrubber inside you don't need that you can just use regular cups for the time being but I would recommend you use like Mardi Gras cups or disposable cups or something that doesn't look like your normal drinkware because nobody wants to be drinking watercolor water and then finally you're probably going to need some paper towels for a million different reasons I like to use the Viva paper towels they have served me quite well over the years since this is a crash course and not the super duper in-depth thing, I do definitely have videos where I go into everything in more depth and I definitely, definitely have blog posts where I talk about everything in loads more detail, but this is meant to be kind of doable. I am not going to cover every single type of paper, every single option of paper, what they all do or when you might want to use them. I'm going to keep things really succinct and brief, which is difficult for me if you guys can't tell. So. There's obviously going to be stuff that I'm going to omit, but I've covered that in other videos. I've talked about that in more depth elsewhere. So we're just gonna roll with it. So basically, there are lots of different types of papers, but if you live in the US, you probably have two main options. You have cotton rag watercolor paper, and you've got cellulose watercolor paper. Now you will note that cotton rag typically proudly proclaims that it is cotton rag, whereas cellulose is usually very coy about being cellulose. So what's the difference? There's a lot of differences. First of all, cellulose is made from wood pulp and cotton rag is made from ground up cotton fibers. That means in, at least based on how they're manufactured, cotton rag is going to typically be more absorbent. That even includes the hot press, which we'll talk about that more in a minute, than its partnering crime of cellulose. So if we're comparing apples to apples, like cotton rag hot press to cellulose hot press, cotton rag hot press is still gonna be more receptive to watercolor than cellulose. Cellulose is typically sold as a student grade option. I do use cellulose. I'm not here to dunk on cellulose. I frequently paint on cellulose, but I do think that for most artists, cotton rag is going to be the more preferable option. 
doesn't work perfectly for everyone. Like for example, I paint seven inch Kara on Canson Montval cellulose watercolor paper. There are a few reasons why I do that. Not only is it a little more economical for me, a self-publishing comic artist who is literally painting hundreds of comic pages to be able to afford to literally paint hundreds of comic pages, but it also runs through my printer a little bit better and it holds details or the details in the way I want it to hold details a little bit better than cotton rag paper. Typically, I use cotton rag paper for illustrations and I use cellulose paper for maybe those paper children that I like to make or comic pages or if I'm getting kind of mixed media. But really, I encourage you if you have the time and the inclination to play with both and figure out with you what you like. Different brands are gonna bring different things to the table and there are so many different watercolor paper brands out there and not all of them are created equal. So for, you know, the concerns of time, I'm gonna talk mainly about cellulose. I've tried several. Generally, I pretty much only like Canson's Cellulose watercolor paper when it comes to watercolor. Strathmore's watercolor paper is great for, well, some of them are great for mixed media applications or pen and ink applications or spot color applications. Fabriano's studio grade watercolor paper, which is I think a 25% mix of uh, cotton with the rest being cellulose, but they also have cellulose papers. That one is fun for inking on. So cellulose watercolor papers do have their uses, just not necessarily for watercolor, at least not if you're hoping to achieve traditional watercolor techniques like wet into wet. And the reason for this is that your water, your paint, your pigments, they just sit on the surface of your cellulose paper. Whereas on your cotton rag paper, they actually start to soak in a little bit and you're gonna get more diffuse blends. You're gonna get softer transitions. You're gonna be able to do more layers because they're getting trapped in the fibers. Whereas on your cellulose paper, if you do too many layers, it's gonna start to just slough off. So this is way more economical. You can find it at way more places, including Walmart and Michaels than this. However, if you've never tried cotton rag watercolor paper, and you don't know if you actually like watercolor, please do yourself a big favor and actually try cotton rag watercolor paper. Now your watercolor paper, regardless of whether it's cellulose or cotton rag, is gonna come in a few different forms. You can get those big sheets of watercolor paper. I'll show you one of those later on when we're talking about watercolor techniques. Those are typically pretty pricey. And while it might make you feel like a real deal artist, they are so big, they are so cumbersome. I basically only ever buy them if I need to create a watercolor demonstration that's poster size, or if I can't buy that particular paper in a smaller format. Next, you'll find pad or tape bound watercolor paper. So it's only attached at the top and otherwise it's free in the book. You can also find spiral bound or hard bound. I'm gonna lump those in with sketchbooks though. So pad bound, it's really more designed to be torn out and then adhered, either stretched or just taped down to something else for structure because otherwise it will tend to buckle as it absorbs water. You also have what's known as block bound, which we talked about a little bit, where it's adhered on at least two sides to hold it tight as it absorbs water and to allow it to dry flat. Not all blocks are made equally. That's one of the reasons I do review block bound watercolor paper here on the channel from time to time. But a good one will hold it tight and is typically bound on all four sides so that it doesn't buckle and it doesn't peel loose. Now, there's some hybrid types like Stonehenge used to come on two sides, but I think it was really meant, really intended for you to remove it. And that's usually what I would do. You can remove your block bound watercolor paper from its block either before or after painting using a palette knife like this. And when it comes to watercolor, I don't mull or mix my own watercolors just because I've got enough hobbies, I don't need another. So the only thing I really use palette knives for is you insert it here at the opening and then you pull and it will slice through the glue and remove your page from its block. So if you like to run your watercolor paper through a printer, like if you're printing a comic page, this 
to be your buddy. If you don't have a palette knife, you can use a butter knife. Just use the dull side to kind of pull your way through. You can also use a bone folder if you happen to have one of those. So when we're talking about cotton rag watercolor paper, there are typically two types that are commonly available, mold and machine made, so like this, and handmade watercolor paper. Mold or machine made is typically, and they do vary, and I highly recommend you look them up on YouTube because the processes for all three are really very interesting. But it has a more even texture, while it might have some surface texture, which we'll talk about a bit little about a little bit later on, unless it's quote unquote rough press, you're not gonna have these extreme highs and lows in the divots of the paper. It's also typically a little bit cheaper than handmade watercolor paper. This is Shizen. This is a handmade watercolor paper that I happen to really like. I really like both the hot press and the cold press. It is a finicky paper. It is a bit of a temperamental paper. I really, really enjoy it, but it is absolutely not for every artist out there. If you can get a sample to play with before you commit to it, I highly recommend doing that. Or if you have a friend that you can split a block with, that would be helpful. So they do sell it in a variety of different formats. This is the pre-cut blocks and I got it on sale because at the time it was not super popular at David's. So it gave me an opportunity to buy a bunch of it, get used to it, play around with it and kind of fall in love with it without spending a whole lot of money. But it really kind of depends on what kind of watercolor art or illustration you want to make and what are your goals with watercolor because these handmade papers, even the hot press, which has a smoother texture, still has a pretty pronounced texture and it can be a little bit challenging to work with if you're not familiar with watercolor or if you want to get really, really intricate and really, 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 really realistic with what you're painting or drawing. So within cellulose and cotton rag, handmade and mold made, there are three different paper surface distinctions. You have hot press, which is run through hot rollers and thus is like ironed out. It has a much smoother paper texture. The camera is not gonna show that. So that's why I'm not necessarily showing it to you guys. So if you are familiar with like Bristol board, it's kind of like that. And it can't necessarily take as many layers of watercolor as say a cold press cotton rag because those fibers have been kind of ironed out. However, it often does take ink, like, you know, whether you're using microns, brush pins, or dip pin and nib, it does tend to take inking a lot better. So that could be a good choice for a comic artist who just want to add a little bit of watercolor to their art. We also have cold press, which is not run through hot runner rollers. It's run through the rollers after they've, they are cool or after the paper is cool, kind of depends on the process. And cold press has a much more pronounced surface texture. Some would even say assertive. It kind of depends on the brand. Different brands are going to have different amounts of surface texture. Me personally, I actually like kind of an irregular surface texture. Some of them have kind of like a linen-like texture that I just, I hate it. Like I think it looks so bad with my art. But it looks good with some people's art, just not my art. And then you have rough press or not press, which has the most assertive texture of all. It can be a lot of fun to paint on, but it can be also like painting on sandpaper. It can be very assertive. Now, in these papers, there's something known as sizing. Now, you can have like vegetable sizing or you can have animal-based sizing. Kind of depends on the company, kind of depends on your priority. You can have internal sizing. Sizing is what gives the paper itself its structure. So Shizen, this handmade paper, doesn't have a lot of sizing. Once it gets wet, the paper has a tendency to get kind of pulpy and it can be easier to damage the paper surface. So you have to kind of wait until it's dried out some or dried out all the way to kind of see how your watercolor painting is really turning out. And I've got some videos where I actually paint on Shizen and I'm totally thinking it's in the ugly phase and then it dries out overnight. And I'm like, oh yeah, I really like this. So it, it's a paper with a personality. I really like its personality, but it takes some getting used to. So sizing can definitely be a friend of yours. Now, external sizing. Uh, Windsor & Newton had this watercolor paper for a while and people complained that it was very soapy. Um, it was hard to paint on. It felt like it was resisting the paint. That paper had a lot of external sizing. I actually kind of liked that paper, but I could see what they were talking about. And I definitely noticed that soapiness. 
So you don't want too much internal or external sizing, but you really don't want too much external sizing. Now, a misconception that I have heard is that by soaking or stretching your watercolor paper, you're gonna remove your sizing, and that is absolutely false. As long as you're using cold water or cool water when you're stretching your watercolor paper, that should not be a problem. It might soften it, that allows you to actually stretch it, but once it dries, it's going to kind of tighten up and firm up anyway. Now, if you use hot water and you soak it, there's a good chance that maybe you could remove some of that sizing because sizing is often gelatin based and everybody knows what happens with jello. You add in boiling water, right? And you mix it and it dissolves, but then you cool it and it firms up. So I just wanted to clear that up because I know if one person, I mean, I kind of got in an argument with somebody over Twitter about it years ago. It was somebody I knew though. So does that make it better or worse? Um, if one person makes thinks that, you know, I, f I figure it's probably not unheard of and I wanted to just address it so that's not something you guys worried about. I wanted to talk about paper weights and your paper weight has something roughly to do with how much the paper weighs in a certain amount. I can never remember that. So basically for us talking about it more practically, it really has to do with the paper thickness to a degree and how sturdy the paper is and whether or not you need to stretch it. So watercolor paper is typically available in 90 pound, which is like a lightweight cardstock sort of weight. 140 pound, which is like a heavier cardstock sort of weight, and that's what I typically use. And 300 pound, which is almost like an illustration board. So I typically use 140 pound. It's just easier to find, it's cheaper. It does everything I need it to do. The downside is 140 pound is going to need some kind of support. You're either gonna to need to use it on a block, tape it down, stretch it. You gotta support it somehow. It's, it's a lot like me. I need that support, y'all. Oh, send me nice comments. So 140 pound, this is an example of the Stonehenge mini pads. It looks something like this. If you don't support it or stretch it, it will typically start to buckle and it can dry buckled which is, some people kind of like that. Some people like painting like that. I'm not dissing it. I don't like it myself. I find that then the water pools in weird places and lifts up in weird places and I need control. I need support and I need control. So I usually will stretch or at least tape down my watercolor paper. 300 doesn't need that much support. You can often just paint on it as is. That said, the larger your sheet of paper, the more likely you're gonna need to support it some way. Even if you're just using like Chinese watercolor weights like this, just to hold it down so it dries flat. So 300 pound, 140 pound, and y'all, I don't have any 90 pound because I don't like that stuff. Come with me and you'll see a world of gross simplification. So there are so, so many things one can say about watercolor brushes, but I don't want to scare y'all off. So we're going to grossly simplify this today. We're going to start by talking about the fiber types, and then we're going to talk about the actual shapes of the brushes. So a gross simplification, neglecting many other types of brushes. For watercolor, you typically have three types. You have natural hair brushes, you have synthetic fiber brushes, and then you have mixed fiber brushes, which are a combination of some kind of natural hair and some kind of synthetic. When we're talking about synthetic brushes, typically it is either white tacalon or golden tacalon. Anybody who tries to make golden tacalon seem super fancy, special, and luxurious is lying to you. The cheap, cheap brushes are made from golden tacalon. The more expensive synthetics are usually made from tacalon. The difference is how they're cut, whether or not the brushes are flagged, i.e. Uh, individual teeny tiny divots or kind of points on the hair so that it holds more water. Things like that, the quality of the handle, the quality of the ferrule, things like that. So you guys can hear my bias. I'm not super big on synthetic brushes. Generally, I find them great in larger sizes because they're very affordable or great in shapes I very rarely use, but I don't typically seek them out because 
honestly, especially in smaller sizes, they often can't do what I want them to do. I also have like a boatload of synthetics that I bought over the years or got sent in various like art snacks and sketch box and those kind of subscription boxes. So synthetics are the are usually the freebies that they send you or the pack-ins or the look at this great brush. So there's not, I don't want to say there's nothing wrong with synthetics. There are pros and cons to all three types of brushes. I would just say synthetics are not really a good fit for me, but I have a lot of friends who really like synthetics. And when it comes to larger watercolor brushes, I think synthetics are more economical. And for the kind of watercolor painting I do at the size that I do it at, I cannot necessarily tell the difference between a synthetic brush and a natural fiber brush. That also said, if we're dealing with the really big sizes, a synthetic brush might be $40, whereas its natural hair counterpart can be $300 to $400, which that's a lot, especially if you don't have any sponsors. That's a lot of money. So I can't necessarily swear up and down that those larger size natural brushes are just the end all be all. So when it comes to natural hair brushes, you have what's known as camel, which is a pony hair. It's gonna be really coarse. You remember those Crayola brushes that would like fray all over the place? Those are camel hair. That's typically sold as student grade. That's typically sold to kids. They're, they're not good. <laughs> they're not good. Next, you're gonna have squirrel. Squirrel is fine. It can be a little bit soft. So if you have, you know, hand control issues, squirrel might not be the best pick for you or it might be something that you practice really hard to get really good at. And then we used to have Kalinsky Sable, which we don't really have so much anymore. Natural hair fibers in terms of a painting experience are great. It's like the Cadillac, but they're ethical concerns because obviously those hairs have to come from someone and it's not like those animals are just like, yeah, here, locks of love, have a bunch of my hair. No, 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 no. So I definitely see you with the ethical concerns. That also said, a good natural hair brush that is well taken care of can last like 50 years. Is yours gonna last like 50 years? Do you have cats? If you have cats, probably not, because I don't know about you, but Bowie likes to chew the bristles of most of my watercolor brushes, even if I put them up. So, you know, oh, and rougher watercolor papers can start to blunt your watercolor brushes. So, you know, a full natural hair brush might not be the best pick for you. So then you have mixed fiber brushes, like these silver black velvet. They're a combination of synthetic and squirrel. Now they do not solve the ethical concerns of natural hair brushes, but they do, oh, wait, I'll get back to that then. Sorry, ADHD, brain remember to, you know what, I'll just go there now. Okay, so hair will biodegrade over time, but these synthetic fibers will not. So realistically, this is gonna end up in a landfill one day and it's never going to, it's gonna turn into microplastic and cause further problems, but it's never gonna truly biodegrade. Hair does actually biodegrade. So these mixed fiber brushes, part of them will biodegrade eventually and part of them will stay around forever. So that's also definitely a concern for a lot of people. But I would say in terms of price, and usage and longevity. If we're just talking about actually using these watercolor brushes, these are really good. I think you'll be pretty happy with them. When it comes to making art, we all have decisions that we have to make. So that's why I'm trying to be as honest with you guys as possible. Sometimes people can get really, really heated about these decisions that we have to make as well. There are pros and cons to everything. You can buy teeny tiny bespoke handmade brushes. I think Rosemary & Co used to do that. And you're supporting a small business, but they are super duper expensive. And then there's been complaints that the quality is hit or miss. You can buy mass produced brushes and pay basically nothing and throw them in the garbage can as soon as they make you somewhat marginally upset. That's still a decision that you have to make but hopefully I'm providing you with some useful information that will help you guys at least be able to start making decisions if you haven't already and will empower you to Google them if it's an issue that you care about that much. 
So we're about to simplify things a whole heck of a lot more because we're gonna be talking about brush types and I am intentionally, through no slight, because I do love them, it's just, it would be a bit of a derailment. I'm not gonna talk about Sumi brushes. I'm not gonna talk about Chinese watercolor brushes. I'm not gonna talk about Menso brushes or shading brushes or Hake brushes or special effects brushes. I am going to talk about these brushes that are right here in front of you guys, the ones that you are gonna see pretty often. Now I will say that a hockey brush is kind of a wide flat brush. Um, it's really useful for stretching watercolor paper. I really like hockey brushes. Um, and I will also say that Sumi brushes can be a great way if you want to paint with natural hair to affordably paint with natural hair. They're wonderful for regular, for, I'm um, sorry, Western style watercolor. I don't mean to imply that one is regular and one is not, sorry. Uh, they're great for Western style watercolor as well. I just don't wanna have to explain a whole lot. Now, I believe I have a blog post where I talk about Sumi brushes. That or I started one and I never finished it. And I do have videos where I talk more about watercolor brushes in general. So if you're interested in learning more about that, there are resources out there for you guys. But we're gonna talk about the ones that you will probably see the most often in the watercolor selection of your Michaels, maybe your Walmart, maybe your favorite art supply store. We have a mop. They are available in a variety of different filaments. So the basic sections of a brush are the bristles, the ferrule, which is typically made of metal. Nicer ones have two crimpings on them. And then the handle, which can be made out of, typically made out of wood or made out of plastic or acrylic, but acrylic's a type of plastic. Even if it looks like it might be plastic, it might have a lacquer coating on it. You guys can see where it started to chip off here. I want you guys to take this really seriously when I say this. I don't say this to be rude. I don't say this to be mean, but I see it in every single watercolor class I teach, whether it's kids or adults. People will leave their watercolor brushes standing upright in the water. <sighs> so you're gonna ruin your brush. You're gonna ruin my brushes because it's my class and I'm providing the brushes. You're gonna ruin my brushes if you do that. The reason for this is multifold, really. Most brushes are not really designed to just be left in dirty water. And then most of the time that water is way up here on the handle. So what happens is it seeps into the metal ferrule, goes into the wooden handle, which is wood, so it absorbs it, the wood expands, and then when it dries out, it contracts. The lacquer starts to crack, it starts to separate from the ferrule. Even if you're careful, and I'm very careful, that can start to happen, but it's definitely going to happen if you leave your brushes in watercolor water. It'll also deform the bristles. Uh, just gravity, storing your brushes like this over time is going to deform the bristles. There are ways that you can save them. So with synthetic brushes like this, if you suspend it, very carefully, so none of the wood, just some of the metal ferrule, if it's in boiling water, it will cause the bristles to straighten out again. If you have natural hair brushes, you can use what's known as brush soap, or, or you can use like a non-lotion-y sort of bar soap, so a cheaper soap, even ivory could be good for that but they do sell something known as brush soap that works, it's uh, General's Old Master's Brush Soap. It smells great, it works great. Not only does it clean your brushes, it conditions your brushes. Highly recommend. Anyway, uh, lather it on, shape the bristles by hand so that they go back into the shape you want, let it dry fully. And just do that for, for as long as you need to to get them to kind of reset. Now sometimes a brush will just be ruined, ruined, but those two techniques typically work quite well. For a mixed fiber brush like this, I would just use the brush soap. The brush soap is also great because with natural hair and mixed fiber brushes, it does recondition it. So if your brushes are looking dry, they're splaying out all over the place, try conditioning it and see if that helps. 
So back to types of brushes before I kind of sidetrack myself. A helpful sidetrack, but still a sidetrack. So mops, great for applying lots of water, great for stretching your watercolor paper, also useful as magic wands. These are known as flats or sometimes brights. They are measured in inches or quarters of inches. I guess if you live in a metric part of the country, might be millimeters, I would say, but it's inches here so there you go these can be really helpful for like graduated or gradiated washes if you're a landscape paper painter they can be good for painting in the reflection on the water or for more architectural like if you need straight lines or to fill in flat areas these can be really helpful i have a few I don't use them super often. This one I use the most often, but I still don't use them super often. Then we have angled shaders or angled brushes, also measured in inches or half inches, and it's a flat with a cut taken out of it. One more thing though about this flat. Often with flats, you will see them with a plastic handle, and that part of it has been molded or formed to kind of create a sharper angle. This is used to score watercolor paper. We're going to talk about scoring your watercolor paper and when you might use that a little bit later on, but I just thought I'd point it out. Now this, theoretically, what I said about it cracking the handle, that's not going to happen to this one, but you're still going to ruin the brush, the bristles. So then we have a dagger, pretty similar to a angled shader like this. Pretty useful for expressive brush stroke. This one is a King Art one, so pretty cheap. Definitely Golden Tacalon. This is also Golden Tacalon. It's just been dyed to look more like natural fibers. Then we have my own personal favorite, the ones I use the most often, rounds. They are round, generally. They come to a point. You can also have something that's known as a liner or a rigger. It's a round with a really, really, really long, like, poo. I don't use them all that often. Mind of Watercolor says that they're even better than a round. I believe him, but I, oh, and they're supposed to be good if you have hand tremors because all that brush kind of evens things out. I just, I just haven't really tried them. That's. That's all there is to it. I just haven't really tried them. I have a bunch of synthetic ones, but I've never committed to a natural hair fiber one because I'm cheap. And then finally we have quills. This is one that got sent to me when I purchased some Paul Rubens watercolors. It was a pack-in and I actually fell in love with it. It has mixed reviews. I believe it is squirrel. And a quill is very similar to a round. I couldn't necessarily say one is better than the other. Other than um, it's kind of a tat, it's more like the old fashioned, old timey kind of watercolor brush. Like if you are thinking about Leonardo da Vinci, you're probably envisioning this kind of ferrule, this kind of attachment. And often these are hand, I mean, some of these are handmade, but often these are handmade because they're, so basically they measure out the brush, they cut it, blunt cut it to fit against the handle, and then they wrap this around and then they will shape it by hand, like a haircut for a brush. So which of these are absolutely necessary? This probably, this probably, and rounds probably. You could probably get away with just those. But you know, the more you paint, and especially the more you become reliant on your brush strokes, the more you're gonna wanna play around with other types of brushes. And I didn't include any special effects brushes like fans or shaders in here, like the dot into the pigment kind of shaders. Those are really cool. I just, those are really cool, but they're not necessarily an everyday watercolor supply that you absolutely need to be familiar with. So next, now that we've kind of talked about all these, I've got another pad of Blick Studio watercolor paper. I want to demonstrate the kind of brush strokes they make. And for this, I'm using Rosa Galleria watercolors. I have a review and a field test of those. So I'm not really going to go too much into it. So the mop is going to give you, I'm just going to pick up a little bit of color. It's going to cover a larger area you'll get this kind of dry brush technique if you don't really, really saturate it. It can put down a lot of water, so it can be really useful for covering a large area. 
You want to clean that paint out though, especially if you mostly use it for stretching your watercolor paper. Our flat can do very similar, can also cover a large area of paper and you guys are seeing a lot of dry brush here. And that's because I'm just dipping it in my cup and then grabbing it from the half pan. I'm not mixing it. And mixing it can be useful because it can help disperse it onto your brush if you don't want a dry brush effect. You can also use it for kind of like a brickwork texture. So really easy. Or you can use it to do straight lines. flat, or I'm not the flat, I'm so sorry, the angled is going to be pretty similar to the flat in terms of you can cover this one, not a larger area, but you can cover an area quickly, or you could use it to paint kind of bricks, or you can use it. This one is a little bit more precision because it has that angle. It can really kind of get in there. The dagger, which is a new one, newish one to me, this one is a little more expressive because it has that interesting shape going on. This one might be good for brush lettering or hand calligraphy, but not as good for these kind of like straight line architectural, at least using this side. That is better though. This is almost like a striper where you can get like a really nice fine line on it. Our quill. Great for when you want to feel like a Renaissance painter, but a quill can give you some really beautiful expressive line work, like good for painting, say, petals or hair. To me, quills and rounds are kind of just like good all rounders. I can do a lot of different things with them. I can pull fine lines. They have the bounce and the capacity to pull longer lines or to really vary my line weight. And one more thing I want to kind of point out to you guys. So as I spill water everywhere, you see this rounded part on the brush. That's what's known as the belly. That's what holds the water in your brush. So the belly is important because it literally holds the water in your brush. So synthetic brushes don't really have that. So they really can't hold as much water and they tend to be way more prone to dripping all over the place. So water control is more challenging if you're using synthetic brushes than if you're using mixed brushes or if you're using natural fiber brushes. And also a well cut round, whether it's a quill or whether it's a round round, is going to have a belly and then when wet come to a nice fine point that's something you want to look at and this is gross especially during times of covid but if you're in a store and you want to see if it's going to come to a fine point used to be you'd put it in your mouth to see if it <laughs> so gross now that i talk about it to see if it comes to a, fi a fine point i thought that was gross even before covid some stores do have like little cups of water here and there however in the store, your watercolor brush is probably going to have some sizing in it. And that's just to protect it while it's in the store and people are handling it and traveling with it. You can wash that out with cold water in the sink. So it's meant to be removed. Please, please wash your watercolor brushes before you use them for the first time because I'd feel so bad for you if there was a bunch of sizing in your paint or you couldn't get your brush to work properly because of the sizing. Now, if you're traveling with your watercolor brushes, something I like to do in addition to my other precautions is I like to use brush soap, shape my brush and let it dry because that's gonna act kind of like sizing while also conditioning my brush. Then finally, we have a round. And everything but the mops are available in lots of different sizes. Mops are only available in a few different sizes. So you can get super teeny rounds. You can get really big rounds. Really big rounds tend to be pretty expensive. Big price tag to go with a big round. 
And these are just really versatile for watercolor comics because you paint a lot of different things and rounds are capable of handling a lot of different things. So this is one of the Zen watercolor brushes I was telling you guys about. It also comes to a point at the end for scoring. Now, this has kind of mixed stories about, first of all, this is a very cheap type of crimp. It's basically a crimp for you for looks only because it doesn't even go in. But this is a plastic handle. So like, what are you biting into? Like with the wood, you crimp it so it bites into the wood. With this, they probably glued it in. That's another reason you don't want to wash your watercolor brushes in hot water because A, it'll dissolve the glue in your brush so the bristles will fall out and B, it may dissolve the glue that holds the ferrule onto the handle. So anyway, very cheap kind of ferrule and I lost. <laughs> okay, now I remember. So on Dick Blick, this is supposedly entirely synthetic. According to watercolor snacks though, this is a mixed brush with natural and synthetic. But the price tag for these is really pretty low. So it is probably synthetic. But it's not a bad synthetic. I've tried a bunch of different synthetics and this one, really not a bad one at all. And you can find them like everywhere, including like Michaels. So this is an old Michaels brush. It is a Simply Simmons. You see some white gouache. We'll talk about that in a minute. These, not so great for watercolor in my opinion. They don't hold a lot of water. They're kind of stiff. What I do think they're good for is using them with white gouache to add accents after I finish painting and to kind of tighten everything up. So your stiffer synthetic brushes that are not really good for watercolor can be great for adding fine details later on or for adding gouache later on. So I think that covers all of our different types of brushes. One more time for the people in the back. This is a mop, good for covering large areas. This is a flat, also good for covering large areas and architectural. This is an angular shader or an angled brush, also good for covering large areas, also good for architectural, really good for getting in with those fine details because it does have that sharper tip. This is a dagger, it's gonna be more expressive, but not necessarily so great for architectural details or those sort of straight lines. This is a quill, Quills are great, they're very similar to rounds. Both quills and rounds are just good all rounder brushes. Larger ones can cover larger areas of paper, but they are just good all rounders from painting flowers to painting people. So if you paint a variety of things, rounds can be your friend. We're gonna continue our journey of oversimplification because this is a crash course and I have to remind myself not to get too far into the weeds with this for you guys. Now, when it comes to student grade versus professional grade paint, because we're talking about paints now, I have some videos about it and I'm going to be doing a video later on when I finish up my student grade showdown because y'all, I have some thoughts, but basically, Student grade paints are manufactured with cheaper materials, including cheaper pigments and cheaper binders. That's what holds the actual particles of pigment onto the paper. They are manufactured with cheaper materials to make it cheaper for you, the consumer, hence the student part. But they don't really necessarily, some are better than others, perform like watercolors generally should which is why historically it's been really difficult for me to recommend student grade watercolors. However, I'm doing the student grade showdown now and I have found some student grade watercolors that really excel. So I will talk about those a little bit later on, but we already talked about the Mei Liang pigments. Now, professional grade watercolor, supposedly, allegedly, is made with higher quality materials, higher quality pigments, more expensive pigments, more expensive binders, often nicer palettes, that sort of thing. Regardless of the quality, you can get paints in tubes, in half pans, and sometimes in full pans. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. And of course, there's also like watercolor pencils, watercolor markers. We're, that's, that's not crash course, that's another video. Now, many brands do make a professional version and also a student grade version. There's nothing wrong with that. If you use uh, Windsor & Newton, you might be familiar with Cotman, their student grade version. 
What I don't like about that is in the US, student grade watercolors from brands like Sennelier and Winsor Newton are almost as expensive as their professional counterparts. So generally I advocate that people just spend the extra money and go professional grade because it's gonna last them longer and they're gonna be happier. So typically student grade is also made with extenders, something to extend the paint. It doesn't mean it lasts longer for you. It means it's cheaper to produce. That has its pros and cons. It makes it cheaper, but it's also one of the reasons that student grade often doesn't handle the same way professional grade watercolors might. And it's also why if you buy student grade, you may notice your paint getting used up really quickly. Whereas if you buy professional grade, it tends to last a really long time. You can get a lot of painting out of a single half pan. So to me, as someone who loves watercolor and has been watercoloring for a long time and is going to continue watercoloring for a long time because I'm only two volumes in on a four volume watercolor comic series, it's worth spending the extra money to get higher quality, to get pigments that I can count on that are not necessarily gonna shift or harden and not be usable or basically evaporate into nothing. I like paints I can count on because I'm painting hundreds of comic pages and I need to be able to count on them. There are some good student grade ones out there. So I want to show you guys, let's start with the student grade paints. This is typically what you would see at like Michaels or Walmart. Basically you will see them at art supply stores, but basically if a store's focus isn't art supplies, they're going to probably have student grade watercolors and it can be really deceptive because there are a lot of paints that are basically student grade watercolors that handle and perform like student grade watercolors that claim to be professional quality or master quality which is another reason I'm doing the student grade showdown so if you are going to spend oh this isn't the one I thought it was sorry if you're gonna ooh, it stinks too if you're gonna spend a lot of money on paints if you're going to make an investment and Typically good watercolors can be kind of pricey. A lot of people do have sticker shock, but I want to remind you guys that watercolor in the long run is cheaper than acrylics and it's cheaper than oils. And while it's not cheaper than digital because you have infinite paint and paper with digital, you do end up with a pretty cool finished product that you can hold in your hands without having to go to a printer at the end of it. So that is a big plus. You generally are going to want to pay more than twenty dollars for you know twelve colors like that you should get comfortable with that idea now so there are a lot of options when it comes to student grade paints some of them are real wacky and wild and i love a gimmick so i love me the wacky and wild ones usually they get bonus points just for being weird i'm weird so they get bonus points for being weird um, these are actually okay. Now, everything I am showing you guys, I've reviewed it. Mm, and I think everything I'm showing you guys, the review is live with maybe one exception. So you guys can look up any of these if any of these look interesting to you. These are the See Me Art watercolors. They are all over Amazon. They are typically rebranded. These are really, 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 really bad. I am starting to see as I'm reviewing cheap student grade watercolors that they use dye instead of pigments. And the problem with this, there are going to be dye based watercolors where that's on purpose, whether we're talking about radiant watercolors or we're talking about lake pigments, which are just dyes that have been attached to a substrate and then formed into watercolors. The problem with these kind of dye based watercolors is as soon as you turn to water, the color goes away. So you can't do light washes, you can't do gradients, you can't do wet into wet because these fall apart. And if you watch the video, I talk about that a lot more. So they look very bright and colorful and pretty in the half pans and they are horrible, horrible as watercolors. So that's my PSA for today. Now some are better than others. The Rosa Galleria watercolors are a lot better than the Simi Art watercolors. I had some problems with them, but I think I will chalk that up to European. There, there are problems that are kind of common to European watercolors that I struggle with, but you might not. So I'm gonna chalk it up to just a different kind of formulation rather than the actual quality of the paint. But this palette, 
is around $35. So it's very, very reasonable. Then we have the Meiliang Pigments Palette, which I already talked to you guys about. While it is not the professional grade from the same brand, it's really pretty excellent. Now, one of the downsides to this particular palette is it's not, because these are in a cheap plastic liner, it's not as easy to upgrade this as you run out of colors with more professional colors. So that's why I recommended that Aowin palette a little bit earlier. And then this weird, wacky, and wild, wonderful palette from Superior is definitely probably student grade. You cannot refill it, but it's actually really fun to paint with and it doesn't do too bad. So some of the problems with student grade, your watercolor illustrations are just not gonna last as long because colors are gonna fade, colors are gonna shift. As you're actually painting the painting, you're not gonna be able to do as many layers colors are going to get really chalky and weird and they might start to lift up. You're not going to be able to do a lot of the same techniques that you would be able to do with professional grade watercolors. And that's one of my big uh, about student grade is if you love watercolor techniques, if you love watercolor for the wet and to wet and the wild blooms and the soft gradients and the beautiful, beautiful gra uh, granulation as the pigment particles, I'll demonstrate that in a little bit kind of separate into nooks and crannies on the paper. Student grade generally isn't going to do that for you. Now for me as a student or as someone who was a student, I wanted watercolors that would do most of what real watercolors should do so I could get a feel for that so I could start learning how to use it. So that's why I usually advocate that you spend a little bit more money and not all of these are price prohibitive and you go for the professional ones. Now, the difference with professional grade watercolors, and this is a simplification again, is they're gonna use higher quality pigments. They're gonna use higher quality binders. They're gonna use higher quality palettes. They're gonna last a lot longer because they're not full of extenders. So we talked about the core mini palette. In this palette, we have the Roman Smalls Aquarius watercolors and I bought these um, I bought a tester set so that's another cool thing about professional grade watercolors is they want you to love them so they will sell test packs with anywhere from uh, three maybe the primary colors to six colors usually at a reduced price so you can actually try them out and see if you like them you can also sometimes buy dot cards but I find those to be kind of overpriced so the testers are where it's at Roman Smalls is one of those companies that did testers. So that's a great way to try out professional grade watercolors and see if you like the brand. And these are cool because Roman Smalls is really pretty affordable. You can get them through Jackson's. I don't have an affiliate link. And they come in whole pans. That This is what a whole pan looks like. So it is like double a half pan. Anyway, you get more paint for these and they should last a little bit longer. And we have the Paul Rubens. These are, I okay, disclaimer, they also make tube watercolors and I like their tube watercolors better, but their half pan set is not bad. It's very aesthetic if that is your thing and the paint quality is really pretty good. I think my complaint was really just the, the color selection was not as fun for me as the tube ins. but these are half pans, so they're half the size of a whole pan. They will still last a while. I can paint an entire chapter of Kara, and unless it's like, for some reason I just eat Daniel Smith Undersea Green, I can paint 30 pages of comic without having to refill any pants. So, and those pages are 11 by 14. So, you know, when you buy nicer watercolors, they're gonna last a little bit longer. And that, in a way, is economical. The only reason I would suggest going with student grade is you legitimately cannot afford any more. Or maybe you got a sponsorship and they're paying for it. Or your parents say you can only buy from one specific place and that's all they got. Or your school bookstore scholarship only covers what's in the bookstore and they're only covering one thing. Or you have a very unique use case, like you're doing single layer watercolors or you need a lot of pre-mixed colors available and you don't want to have to do a whole lot of mixing yourself and you're not going to do a whole lot of layering. There are use cases where student grade can be a good fit, but generally, oversimplificating here, 
oversimplificating, oversimplifying here, professional grade has made me happier. And then this is PWC watercolors. They also sell a, a try it out pack. It's like a five color pack, really very affordable. These were filled from tubes. I don't have any of those tubes handy, but typically watercolor tubes look something like this or something like this. So with something like this, I can fill a half pan three times from a tube and a tube this size usually costs as much as a half pan. For something like this, it's closer to five to seven. So tubes can be a really great economical way. And Windsor Newton claims that they're the only company that their half pans are specially formulated for re-wetting, and that might be true. And they insinuate that if you fill your half pans from tubes, it's just not gonna be the same. And while I will admit I did run into a Daniel Smith color Mayan blue that does not reactivate after it sets up in a half pan, it, it, you, you got a rock. That's because it's a clay-based watercolor generally 99.99% .99 of the watercolors I've worked with over my 10 years of painting watercolor comics, that hasn't been a problem at all. I will also say that somebody told me that their watercolors started to mold. So I'm bringing that up to, I, I live in Southeast Louisiana, I've never had that happen, but I'm bringing that up to you guys because maybe don't, I don't know anything about this person's situation, so I'm not making any kind of assumptions or insinuations about them. I'm just guessing what might make watercolors mold. Maybe allow them to dry fully before you put them away. You can put them over a dehumidifier if you wanna accelerate that process. And don't store them for a long period of time, i.e. maybe longer than a week in a non-climate controlled environment. That's all I can think of that might cause them to mold and we'll talk about why in a moment. We're going to talk about binders, the glue that holds your watercolor pigments to the paper and we're going to talk a little bitty bitty bit about handmade watercolors featuring some watercolors made for me by my friend Kabocha. So we're going to start with binders. Typically watercolors are made generally with either gum arabic or honey and brands that use honey brag about using honey. Now, honey can be a great binder. It's a, it absorbs water from the air, so your paints are gonna be ready to activate. They're gonna be ready when you are. The only problem is they might not, they might stay goopy and they might not wanna set up in half pans. You don't have to work with them that way. If you don't want to, you could just like squirt them out as you need them. It kind of depends on who you are and where you are as an artist. But like M. Grams uses honey, Sennelier uses honey. Honey is also antimicrobial and antifungal. So it should not be a good environment for fungus, for mold to grow. That doesn't mean it can't. So if you are buying handmade watercolors from someone who's using earth pigments that they went out and collected themselves, if they didn't sterilize their earth pigments, well, you got dirt. And what does dirt do? So that could be a situation where your hand poured watercolors do start to mold. I could actually see that if the pigments themselves weren't properly sterilized, or maybe they were using cosmetic grade pigments or talc or mica and it wasn't properly sterilized. I could, I could maybe see that <laughs> festering over time. Now, gum arabic is not antimicrobial. It comes from the gum acacia tree. It's also used in food. So both honey and gum arabic are food safe. This bottle has, uh, usually it's like a light yellow color. This bottle has discolored over time. But I love showing people this because gum arabic can make your blues and purples look a little bit dingy. Like for years, I thought I hated ultramarine blue because I just don't like Windsor and Newton's ultramarine blue. And then I tried, Sinel no, Core, Core, and we'll talk about that in a second, Core's ultramarine blue, and I fell in love. So Core uses Aquazole as the binder. This one has yellowed a little bit over time. Mainly I keep these around as demonstrations to people. This used to be a lot clearer, but this has aged way better than this, and these bo this bottle might be younger than this bottle. Um, Aquazole is another somewhat popular 
watercolor medium and it's the, it's the binder that holds the pigments together so if you are making homemade watercolor you do need to add a little extra something to just discourage bacterial and fungal growth so you do have some options and clove oil is a really popular easy one that isn't going to discolor your paper and that's what kabochi used and that's what she talks about in our live stream that we did together which was loads of fun where she demonstrates how to make homemade watercolor so if you're interested in this or if you're just interested in how people do that you should definitely check that out and kabocha mainly uses cosmetic grade pigments for their handmade watercolors but they're using gum arabic although they're using a different form of gum arabic it's in a powder form they're using clove and then they're using a little bit of magic to make something that looks this awesome these aren't the only binders you also have glycerin which is like hand soap or vegetable glycerin which can be used in food and that's typically for children's grade stuff to make it more washable so it's not going to adhere as much to the paper or to clothing and sometimes you have dextrose which is weird so generally i find that when companies are not proud of their materials when they want to hide something from us they'll do just that so i have there have there have been paints where i was like these are super duper weird and i had to really dig and found out they were using dextrose or glycerin companies playing koi includes pigment information I have found that when companies don't want to give pigment information, either they don't know it, like Arteza, because they're working from an, with another company and they're white labeling, i.e. purchasing the product manufactured by another company to sell under their brand name and they don't have the pigment information, or they are intentionally not giving you the pigment information, as is the case with Art, because, and this is just a guess, just a supposition, I think they're using dyes. So... We're going to take a look at a few different things and we're going to talk a little bit about it. <laughs> like we're doing the whole time, Becca. Come on, that was super vague. Anyway, so generally I have found that with professional grade watercolors, they are often very proud of the materials that they're using because those materials are expensive and they want you to know that you're getting your money's worth. So this is the Da Vinci watercolor palette. I love this palette. This is a really good palette. You get whole pans. It's about the same cost as the Core Mini palette. It's just a little bit bigger. Color selection's a little bit different. And it's the same pans, at, or I'm sorry, the same paints as in their tubes, just poured into half pans. So that means you can refill these from the tubes and they work the same. It's great. I love when things work uniformly and work together. But also it's an American company, so that's kind of cool too. But what I really like is this is their swatch sheet it's got the color names it's got transparency info which is important and we'll talk about that a little bit later on and it's also got the pigments listed so and this is this is slippery slope typically you want colors your base colors not convenience colors but your mixing colors to be one pigment maybe two pigments at most it's going to make for cleaner mixes overall, especially if you're using these as mixing colors and you're going to mix them with other colors. The more pigments that are involved in a mix, the quicker it's going to turn to mud, generally. What I like is that they also include the pigment information right there. Now, there are some pigments that are just always used for the same colors, like ultramarine blue is almost always made with PB29, unless it's made with real lapis lazuli. Same goes for Prussian blue, usually PB29. Burnt umber and burnt sienna, usually made with PBR7. You do sometimes see variations, some brands like to get sassy, but typically certain colors are made with the same pigment so when it comes to professional grade it's going to really boil down to finding paints that handle in a way you like and that have attributes that you like because they're probably using very similar pigments from very similar sources so i love it i love it when a company discloses pigment information so here's where things get kind of weird so those of you who watch a lot of YouTube, uh, watercolor YouTube, 
you know about these. Now, I love the super granulating colors, but I have a different use case for them. These have gotten a lot of heat because these are so not light fast. So these do list some pigment information. So there is some pigment going on. They also list the transparency and this little square here, that's like half and half, that would mean it's semi-opaque, so it has some coverage. And then it says light fastness out list. These are very light fugitive. And the reason for that is because they're using dye in order to get the kind of duo color effect that you get from these. So I think they're cool, but these are not really watercolors for anything that you wanna sell or that you wanna display. And they are not forthcoming about that, which is my problem with it. I like the watercolors, but I do wish they would be more honest. When we're talking about watercolor, Typically, most people think about transparency. Watercolor is just known for being very light and transparent and airy. Some people even think it's very kind of weak and very pastel. And a lot of artists, myself included, work really hard to show that watercolor can be way more than just that. But the transparency thing, it has some legs. You see, you've got watercolor, that is typically meant to be transparent. And then you've got gouache, which is an opaque version of watercolor. So generally, if you want transparency, layers, lots of glazing, then you think about regular watercolor. However, you typically have four degrees of transparency when we're talking about watercolor. You have fully transparent, you have semi-transparent, which might have a little bit of a haze. You have semi-opaque, which is mm, maybe half coverage. And then you have opaque, which while not full coverage, because it's, it's not gouache, it's going to be a lot more opaque than your transparent color. And I know that sounds confusing because it's all very relative. I've noticed that European paint companies Typically, their watercolors are just more opaque than their American or Japanese or Chinese counterparts. It doesn't make them poor quality watercolors, but it does make them not really suitable for the kind of watercolor painting that I like to do. So it's going to really vary brand by brand. I do review professional grade and student grade watercolors. So if you're interested in a particular company, you can feel free to reach out to me or check the channel to see if I've talked about those. But if you guys have looked at my comic, 7-Inch Care, which you can read for free at 7inchcare.com, little plug there, you guys will notice that I really like a lot of layers and I like a lot of glazes, and that means I like a lot of transparency. So the, the brands that I typically will recommend to you guys, just move these out of the way, are going to be brands, and move this out of the way as well, brands that are capable of those more transparent washes, brands that are capable of lots of layering, brands that are capable of clean color mixes because that's what I value and that's what I like. So with watercolor, there is a lot of personality and individual touch and a lot of subjectiveness to it. So that's why I think it's really important if you can, if you've got a local brick and mortar or just a local store that does in-person classes or in-person demos, and you're interested in watercolor, go and get your hands on some art supplies and actually play around with them and see what you like. When you're just starting out with watercolor, it can be really hard to know what you're looking for and what you're looking at. And even asking people who work at the art supply stores can be hit or miss. Watercolor is its own specific medium. And if that person isn't an artist or if they work in a different medium, they might not be able to help you. That's why people here on YouTube, as well as people who write blogs, spend a lot of time talking about what they like and what they're looking for in watercolor. And everyone's taste is going to be very specific towards their end goals. So when you're getting into watercolor, I think it's really wise to start with some recommendations from people whose art you like and that's why I gave you guys some recommendations to kind of help you guys start off on a good foot. Those are paints that I've painted with a lot that I'm really comfortable with and that I'm really happy with and I think they can help most artists, most watercolor artists. I think they will satisfy most people's needs. But as we figure out what kind of art we want to make, what kind of styles we like, what kind of message we want to send and what kind of mediums we want to use, 
then we can start to really narrow things down and develop personal taste. So I've included some examples of my work just in case you forgot. I'm always telling you guys I'm a watercolor comic artist. I paint 7 inch Kara on Canson Montval watercolor paper, which is a cellulose paper, not because it's the best watercolor paper out there, nor because it's the most affordable watercolor paper out there, or because I just love cellulose watercolor paper so, so much. It's really because it is fairly economical, but performs quite well considering it's a cellulose paper and I can afford to buy hundreds of pages of it to be able to paint my comic without losing too much in terms of quality. I'm also used to painting on it. I know how to get it to do what I want it to do. And while I could theoretically paint Kara on cotton rag watercolor paper, which is my preference for illustrations, I feel like I'd have to ink the pages instead of just being able to do pencils. And that would really change up my workflow and the end product. So for me and for Kara and right now, Canton Mont Ball is the best pick, although it's getting increasingly difficult to find. So I might have to find a good second option. And for a lot of my watercolor career, a lot of my time spent working with watercolor, I worked on cellulose papers because it was economical. When I worked anime conventions as a commission artist, I was known for having cute but very affordably priced commissions that I would whip out very quickly. And one of the ways I was able to do that without, you know, losing my shirt, although I was losing my mind, was to work on fluid cellulose watercolor paper, which is very economical but performs pretty well considering. And I would also use Sakura Koi watercolors for that. And these aren't commissions meant to last a million years, but they were definitely meant to commemorate somebody's fandom and to make them happy for the few years that they're going to be up on the wall. So each use case is going to kind of dictate what materials you use and what you're willing to spend. If you can't spend $100 on watercolor paints, you can't spend $100 on watercolor paints. That's all there is to it. Somebody belaboring you or belittling you about that, it's not going to give you $100 to spend on paints. So what I would recommend is just kind of start small, start with what you can afford, buy the best that you can afford, and try a variety of things. Many companies offer sample packs of materials, whether it's paper or paint. Some of them are free. Some of them are very reasonably priced. That can be a great way to try out different materials. You can also try going to local brick and mortar art supply stores, especially during special events like Plaza, which is a small chain, has something known as hands-on creativity, which is a day when you as a customer can go, it's actually a couple of days, you as a customer can go and play around with different art supplies and take art classes for free and actually get your hands on the materials to figure out if you even like them. You can also ask your local brick and mortar if they don't have something like that, if they would consider sponsoring something like that in the future. I worked one of those and I have to say, although it was exhausting, I had so much fun getting to show people the art supplies and explain them to people and demonstrate them for people. I'm super passionate about trying to get people to fall in love with art and trying to get people to realize that anyone can make art. You don't have to even be good at it to love making art. So that could be an opportunity to play around with art supplies. Also, many local library systems offer free art classes. So if you'd like to learn a new art skill, don't be afraid to sign up for an art class. The supplies are generally provided. I know with the classes that I teach, we always provide the supplies for students. And it gives you an opportunity to bring in what you're working with and have someone who's a little bit more experienced maybe explain to you how to get the best out of your art materials. For every different type of art that I do, whether it's illustration or botanical art or comics, I use different materials. I do heavily rely on my Daily Driver watercolor palette, which is an amalgamation of my favorite professional grade watercolors. And I have so many favorites, I've set up several sub palettes. But having everything in one place in a format that is easy for you, and that's what's important, easy for you to use. If this doesn't work for you, don't bother emulating it. Find something that does work for you. Look at what other artists are doing. Try out different things if you can afford to do so. And then when you find something you like, go for it. This is a setup that works well for me, but I'm thinking about moving to a large metal tin and putting magnets on the back of my half pan so I can combine all my sub palettes. 
work with what works for you. I used to use those round plastic daisy palettes. In fact, I still do for seven inch care because I need to be able to mix up a lot of specific colors very consistently, but that doesn't really work well for botanical illustration. Ceramic palettes work better for that. So it's all about trying out different things. Sometimes it's not gonna work. Sometimes it's gonna work great and figuring out what you like and what you don't like. And that's one way that doing art YouTube and sharing my experiences with you guys has been really beneficial for me because I get the added benefit of rewatching my videos when I'm editing them and being able to critique my own work or even critique my own setup and figuring out what I liked about it and what I'm going to change in the future. So I didn't include this in the basic painting supplies, but I would also recommend that you get an archival box something to keep your art in or purchase archival portfolios. I tell you make some and they're very economical and they will protect your art from atmospheric acid and degradation. And even if you don't like your art right now, save it because that's a great way to track your progress and see what you've improved upon and what you still need to work on, especially when you feel like everything is wrong and you can't do anything right. That can be a great way to kind of bolster yourself because I've noticed that with pieces that I don't like when I've initially painted them, if I put them away for a week and then I come back to them, I can see them with fresh eyes and often I can see things I liked about them or things I did well about them or things I enjoy about them, even if I don't enjoy the piece itself. I also recommend hitting up Dollar Tree. Their art supplies are not necessarily great, but there's a lot of auxiliary stuff in the crafter's corner from little bitty glass bottles to plates like this that'll be useful in your watercolor adventures. They even sell masking fluid pickups. This one is actually from Michael's, but I showed you guys one from Dollar Tree earlier. So while their art supplies are not necessarily the best, you can pick up staples. Places like Walmart can also be good for picking up staples. While I've reviewed their watercolors in the past and I'm not super hot on them, I do think like a palette is a palette and if it works for you, that's fine. I also think Michael's is kind of expensive for art supplies. So unless you have a voucher or a coupon, I would really try to support local and see if you have a local art supply store in your area. I promise you they're probably not going to be more expensive than Michael's because Michael's is definitely art supplies at a premium. If you're shopping online for art supplies, Dick Blick can be a great resource. Not only do they offer bulk pricing that starts at just 10 items to the public, you don't have to be a teacher or an educator to access that. They also offer teacher and educator discounts. Although as a gig teacher like myself, I don't have access to that. But if you are a teacher, even if you're teaching math, you should definitely use your discount to buy you some art supplies. And that said, Blick has some of the best prices on the internet. Although Amazon is getting really quite competitive. I always hesitate to mention Amazon because I do see Amazon affiliate money and that revenue is important to doing these kinds of videos, but I don't want to support Bezos either. And I don't like how they treat their workers. So it's kind of a catch 22, but I recognize that a lot of people who live in rural areas and I live in a rural area are reliant on online sources to be able to source art supplies. And if you're ever looking for help, guidance, or recommendations in your watercolor adventures, please feel free to reach out to me over on the paint box. It's my art centric discord server, or give me a shout out during one of my live streams. I try to host Q and A live streams when I can so that I can, you know, show you guys stuff, hang out with you guys and answer your questions. So what am I using in my daily driver palette, which was a whiskey palette because this was before Meaden started selling empty palettes that came with half pans. So inside this palette is a mishmash of Windsor Newton and Daniel Smith and Holbein and Sennelier. And I don't, there is actually a Turner in there and M. Grams and basically, oh, Core. Basically, if I liked a brand and I liked a color from a brand and it's a color I will probably use, it's either in this palette or it's in kind of this overflow palette that has a lot of opaques and pastels. I call it the Naomi palette because it's colors she normally wears. So this is just kind of an amalgamation of years of watercolor painting and putting stuff in that I liked. I started out with Cotman because that's what was available and that was what I had access to and that's what I could afford and I kind of worked my way up and replaced my Cotman's with nicer paints. 
what kind of brushes do I use? I used to swear by Kalinsky Sable brushes. Uh, I couldn't afford the Winsor & Newton ones all that often, so I would get the Jerry Zardorama ones. And those are really good, but they're very expensive. So now I'm painting almost entirely with silver black velvet watercolor brushes, which are a mix of synthetic and squirrel hair. And I have a quill from Paul Rubens that I'm liking so far. Seems pretty decent. And for my larger brushes, I'm just working with synthetics that seem half decent and aren't overly stiff. And the more you paint, the more you're going to get a feel for what feels too soft, what feels too stiff, what you like to paint with, and what you struggle to paint with. When it comes to paper, like I said earlier, for my comic pages, I'm painting exclusively on Canson Montval. And for everything else, it kind of just depends on what I'm doing. Like this was painted on the Arteza round. Do I like it? I don't like the Arteza round. I don't recommend it, but I think the painting turned out cute. Uh, since I'm always reviewing art supplies, I'm always playing around with different things and discovering new papers that I like. But if you're looking for a short list, arches, pad bound, not half bad. Arches block bound, kind of expensive, probably not worth it. Stonehenge Aqua, pretty expensive, tends to get snoozed on, but I use it for pretty much all of my watercolor field tests. So you guys see me use Stonehenge Aqua pretty frequently. I really like Canton Moulin de Roy, but I can only get it through Jackson's. So I try to buy a lot of it if I'm going to buy it at all. And I've reviewed some other papers, but basically that's what I like to paint on the most. If I'm doing Paper Children or some other one-off thing where I need to be working on a really economical paper, I'm probably painting on Canson XL, but I'm going to move away from Canson XL because I find that there's just quality control issues and I haven't been super happy with it and it doesn't handle the way I remember it handling it. And that's who I used to use for watercolor sketchbooks as well. I also really like Shizen watercolor paper. This is their hot press sketchbook. It is a cotton rag handmade paper and it's just really fun for doing botanical studies. So it really kind of depends on what I'm working on. I use a variety of materials, just kind of whatever I think will suit the project that I want to work on. And I realize that's not always accessible to everyone. So I also encourage you guys to make friends with other artists to join artist circles and to send each other samples, share samples with each other, have play dates where you all bring something cool and everybody gets a chance to play around with it because that can make a limited supply of art supplies stretch a whole lot further. Now you guys have seen me review quite a few art supply subscription boxes over the years here on the channel. And you're probably wondering if that's a good way to get into a specific art medium. <sighs> You know, I'd say it's an expensive way because generally you don't really get enough of anything to be able to turn around and create a bunch of illustrations with it. Watercolor snacks wasn't half bad, but it's like $94 including tax when you like, and it's a quarterly thing. So you'd be waiting a while to get more art supplies. But if you have the funds to, and the interest to do so, that could be a viable way to accrue more watercolor supplies and try out stuff that you wouldn't normally try out. So I am not going to talk about watercolor markers, watercolor crayons, watercolor pencils, any of that kind of stuff in this series, mainly because I've talked about it a lot here on the channel. And I also feel like it kind of moves away from what the original intent of this was. And since I'm already super long winded, I figured that could be another story for another day. I almost forgot to mention this, but when it comes to these watercolors, these are not purchased in half pan form. I bought empty half pans and I filled them with paints from tubes. I find that to be much more economical than buying individual half pans. I pretty much only buy half pans if I absolutely have to for whatever reason, whether it's because I'm reviewing those paints and the half pans are the cheapest way for me to review a full set or if it's because that color only comes in half pans or if it's because a friend made me some custom half pans. But typically I find that tube watercolors are a more economical route. And you can do little five milliliter tubes if you're not sure if you like a color that's typically around the same cost as a half pan. 
and uh, you can get like three fills. So you can th fill your half pan three times from a five milliliter tube. So that's each half pan would then be a third of the cost. Now, not all colors from all brands can be reconstituted from half pans. Mayan blue cannot. Daniel Smith's Mayan blue. Um, I that's that and their rhodonite, which I actually I think I removed that from this palette. Nope, it's over here. It needs to go though, because it also doesn't reconstitute anything like its tube form. But typically I found that most tube dried watercolors do reconstitute from half pans quite well. And that's actually something I test when I'm reviewing watercolors is to see if you can bring them back from this form because I find as somebody with a cat in limited space, I find that this format just works a lot better for me and for my needs. And you can buy empty half pan, whole pan, even quarter pans and eighth pans. I mean, those things are the tiniest little chiclets, but you can find those on Amazon. There's also people who 3D print half pans and there's even bio printing where they're using ecologically friendly materials that will biodegrade in time. I would love to start working towards that with casein and cornstarch products so that, you know, I'm not leaving a bunch of empty dead half pans when I'm dead thousands of years from now. But I haven't had a chance to play around with any of those yet. So that's something I'd love to check out later on here on the channel. I really hope today's walkthrough was helpful, useful, and informative for you guys. I remember when I was first getting started with watercolor, although I had a friend guiding me and giving me suggestions and advice, both of us had been on a very limited budget and everything was bought very piecemeal, which can be very expensive if you're looking to accrue a wide selection of watercolors. But I still look back on those days fondly. That was a lot of fun. And that was some of the most fun I've had as an artist because one of the things I love as an artist is connecting with other art supplies the art supplies, connecting with other artists, geeking out about art supplies and having a chance to share some of my favorites and get to try out some new art supplies. There's something just so wonderful and connected about that. It's so community minded that I really, really enjoy. And it's one of my favorite aspects of my longer classes when I can bring my favorites to show my students and have the pleasure of explaining things and demonstrating things to them. I really enjoy it. I've gotten to work as a product rep of very short couple of times and I really enjoyed that as well because being able to help people find their next favorite watercolor or drawing tool is really exciting and maybe getting people to rethink how they think about art and how they think about themselves as artists and sometimes even the possibility that they could be artists when they thought they could never make art or enjoy art as a creator. That's so rewarding and I really love it and it really reminds me of those early days when I was first getting into comics. So it's a delight to be able to share some of my favorite art supplies with you guys and hopefully explain them in a way that is useful and informative for y'all. So we talked about the core mini palette today that's still kind of my top recommendation but throughout this series I am going to demonstrate other watercolor brands and other watercolors and tell you what I like and what I don't like about them so if you're still looking for more information if you're not sure if you're ready to commit I totally understand I got you I talk about a lot of stuff for my friends who are not necessarily for whatever reason, sure that the core palette is a good fit for them. I also talk about my other favorite, the student grade Mei Liang pigment set. This is a much more budget option and it's typically around $20. So this is also a really great place to start and you get a lot of colors. I think I talked about my daily driver palette a little bit. If I didn't talk about it in this video, it's certainly going to come up. It is a smorgasbord, a mutt of different professional grade watercolors that I really like. And this is meant to encourage you to make your own palette of favorites, to mix and match. Don't feel like you have to be brand loyal or brand specific because most good watercolors will all play together. So go with the pigments, the qualities, and the brands that you like the best. We also talked about masking tape and masking fluid, and we talked about palette knives and removing our watercolor from the block. So hopefully this was helpful, useful, and informative for you guys. I look forward to seeing you guys again in the near future in our next installment where we are going to be talking about color mixing. That's pretty exciting. 
And I just want to remind you guys that if you guys have any questions, if you guys have any problems, if you need help troubleshooting things, let me know because at the end of this series, I'm going to host a troubleshooting live stream where I walk you guys through the solutions that I've at least found. I know there's so many ways. That's one of the beautiful things about making art. It's all about problem solving and every artist has a different skill set of how they solve their problems. So hopefully I can show you guys what I do. Maybe you guys can offer me some suggestions in return and it can just be a wonderful hangout and learning experience experience where we can <laughs> get ahead of myself where we can collaborate together if you are new here this is like I said earlier the third video in this series there was a demonstration where I painted some de jellyfish and kind of walked you guys through my watercolor process and before that I kind of walked you guys through my art what kind of art I like to make and why I love watercolor kind of in an attempt to when I say sell you on watercolor, I just mean show you the possibilities and maybe get you to fall in love with watercolor the way I fell in love with watercolor. If you're new to my art, I would really appreciate it if you took the time to check out some of my other tutorials and reviews here on the channel. I talk about art supplies a lot here, particularly drawing and watercolor supplies because I'm a watercolor comic artist and both of those things are near and dear to my heart and I review a lot of supplies not only to help me find stuff that I'm going to love that I can use to paint seven inch Kara, but as also to recommend to my students both as accessible options that might be more affordable because I do review a lot of big box brands but also as a way to help them elevate their art or maybe solve some of the common problems that they're having so that's why it's so important for you guys to get back to me with your watercolor problems because hopefully I've got some watercolor answers if you'd like to check out more of my art it would also really mean a lot to me if you checked out my comic 7 inch Kara you can check it out as a web comic for free at 7 inch Kara.com or if you're a dead a dead tree format person like me if you like books and I love books then you can buy volume one and volume two through the natto shop at well 7inchcare.com slash shop or nattosoup.com slash shop don't worry all of that will be linked down in the description below as well as a list of the materials that I talked about and where you can find them I do want to caveat I am going to utilize Amazon affiliate links when I think that's a fair price and I do see a little bounty from that that can be a great way to help support the channel without spending money that you weren't intending on spending but in general, I think Dick Blick is a great online resource for people who don't have a local art supply store. But if you have a local art supply store, and I don't mean Michael's or Dick Blick, I mean like local, like David's Art Center or Moe's Art Supply, I highly recommend you give them your business because your local art supply store can be a wonderful resource, not only of art supplies, but of re like people who know how to use those art supplies and can curate a selection of art supplies and help you figure out what your next favorite it's going to be and many art stores also offer art classes and some even offer free art workshops so if you can support local even if it means I don't see that bounty I would really appreciate it if you supported local because I love David's Art Center and I want them to continue to thrive and I want them to continue to grow in the future and be there as an art resource for artists for years to come. And I am sure there's an art supply store in your area that's equally awesome that you want to see thrive and grow as well. So if you can bring in that materials list and ask them if they've got those things I'm sure they're happy to help you and if they don't I'm sure they can recommend some decent uh, I'd like to think they could offer some decent alternatives without trying to upsell you so don't be afraid of that most of the time when you go to an art supply store if the person knows what they're talking about if they're trying to upsell you they're probably just trying to convince you to spend that little extra money to buy something that's gonna make you happier in the long term and is gonna last you longer it's not most of them don't see a commission on those sales so it's not about getting you just to spend more money it's about making sure that you're going home with something that you're happy with and will love for years to come because it really sucks when you buy an art supply that isn't so great and you think you don't love art or you don't like watercolor or you don't like acrylic because of that art supply none of us want to see that happen so most of the time if they're trying to push you in a direction it's because it's something they love and they think it'll genuinely make you happier so I look forward to seeing you guys next time when we talk about color mixing. So make sure you bring your paints and your brushes so we can mix some colors together. Hopefully this was helpful, useful, and informative, and hopefully I'll see you guys next time. And hopefully this was helpful in making art a habit. Bye guys.